Good evening and welcome to the New York Symposium with Diane Sayre. I'm Diane Sayre, LaRouche Independent Candidate for U.S. Senate. And I should say right off the bat that we are pre-recording this. I'm very honored to have the Schiller Institute founder, Helga Zepp LaRouche, joining me uh, be in the hours between the pre-recording and when this program will air at 8 p.m., many things can happen. That's the pace of world developments today, which is why I want you to know uh, this is pre-recorded. I just returned from an incredible conference in France, which was convened by my guest, and it came just on the eve of the Vilnius NATO summit, I think very well timed given the current strategic situation and what has to be done. So Helga, if you could share your thoughts about the conference and the potential for that conference impacting the world in the wake of this NATO conference. Well, I think it was extremely important to have this uh, physical conference uh, after several years of uh, Zoom conference, internet conferences only because of the COVID pandemic. So it just uh, illustrated the merit of actually talking to real people because you have a lot of ideas and a lot of, you know, new things develop in such an interpersonal exchange. So I think, you know, in light of the fact that, you know, this was a few days before the NATO summit, as you say, uh, we had uh, an incredibly important uh, number of guest speakers uh, addressing the strategic situation. And given the fact that the <clears throat> Western media, um, the mainstream media has become so absolutely streamlined that you never find out what the other side is saying, uh, it was extremely important that we had actually uh, a very, I would say, balanced representative rep representation of representatives of the different uh, countries. So <clears throat> we had the um, Chinese ambassador to Paris. Uh, <clears throat> his name is uh, Lu Shaye. Uh, he's a fairly important intellectual and thinker. Then we had the Russian representative to the European Union, the Minister Council uh, in Strasbourg, uh, Mr. Subotin. Then we had an important uh, Indian <clears throat> author and journalist, Mr. Mishra. We had the former um, <clears throat> Secretary of State of the Economic Ministry of Italy, Michele Geraci who is uh, famous to have been the author of the Memorandum of Understanding between China and Italy on the Bed and Road Initiative. And then we had uh, <clears throat> Dr. Lemke, who is the editor of the Compass magazine and uh, representative of a whole bunch of organizations from the former GDR from East Germany. And finally, Alain Corobes, who is a retired colonel and advisor to many official places in the French military, French uh, institutions otherwise. So just by the diversity of um, um, personalities from these different countries, you could get a view on the strategic situation from completely different points of views. And I think this is always important because it's not that we, just by inviting somebody from China or from Russia or from India, does not necessarily mean that we take the view of these countries or these people. But it is extremely important for people to develop their own independent judgment on what to make out of the present strategic situation or this or that issue by being able to shift in your mind to take the position of the other side. Uh, you know, I mean, nowadays you have a situation where, you know, if you quote somebody from Russia, you are immediately blasted to be a Putin agent. Or if you take the view of somebody or a report about the view of somebody from China, you are in danger of immediately being named a Chinese agent. While the one lesson from diplomacy and statecraft and the entire history is that you have to be able 
to put yourselves in the shoes of the other to understand the interest of the other because no never was there a peace agreement which did not take into into, into account the interest of the other so many people expressed complete astonishment first of all about the extreme high level of the speakers um, then the absolute high level of discussion and by listening to you know representatives from these different countries in the original tone rather than just uh, reading quotes or having you know short uh, statements uh, mentioned somewhere uh, it is actually possible to see the strategic reality as it is and so, you know, obviously extremely, uh, one extremely important point of concern was the war danger and, you know, one underlying <coughs> subject of the conference was uh, the proposal which has been promoted by the Schiller Institute since the war in Ukraine broke out and that is the idea that we absolutely have to move away from geopolitics. Uh, and we have to establish a new international security and development architecture <clears throat> in order to, you know, basically come up with solutions to end the war. Now, unfortunately, you know, <clears throat> the NATO summit, which took place uh, subsequently, three days later, made very clear why the approach of our conference is so important, because despite all kinds of people talking in Vilnius, there was not one shred of an attempt to go for a diplomatic solution. Just, you know, different, you know, versions of how to build up Ukraine militarily. Uh, should Ukraine be offered an invitation or a timeline to enter NATO or not? You know, essentially what came out of it is was the determination to go for a massive military buildup of Ukraine, make Ukraine even the a factory of weapons, you know, for eternity to come. <clears throat> so I think that our conference clearly is a counterpole in the approach. And uh, I think that was reflected by, by, you know, people expressing extreme happiness. And, you know, in a certain sense, one argument which was mentioned by, by several people is, you know, to come to a conference and then hear people from so many countries and, and so many political backgrounds and all speak for peace, all speak for, you know, go to a more human phase in, in the history of mankind it was such a relief because, you know, over the years of the pandemic, people were sitting mostly at home, feeling isolated. And uh, so to actually hear that there is a whole other world out there was an extreme sign of relief and people were absolutely enthusiastic. Yeah, what you're saying is very much like what President Kennedy said in his American University speech, which is if you want to have peace with the Soviet Union, uh, you should consider what it, the world looks like from their perspective. Otherwise, you can't consider anything. I was struck by a couple of things. One was the speaker from India mentioning how India really is trying to hold itself as a neutral party, because being an American, you know, when Modi came here, it was clear to me they were giving him the red carpet treatment and he was having big dinners and he unfortunately had to have dinner with Kamala Harris and Tony Blinken, I think. <laughs> I guess he kept his food down. But um, he made a point to call Putin after that visit, which I think was very important. The other comment, and I'd like you to say more about this as well, from Colonel Corvez was he had just come from a conference in Iran, which had been attended by 40 different nations. And I think one thing certainly many Americans are not aware of is that the global South, this block of nations that's been kept out or declared less than sovereign, is really asserting their identity and their sovereignty. It's a completely new dynamic in the world. What What are your thoughts about that? Well, that is definitely uh, the case because when the G7 meeting recently, a couple of weeks ago, occurred in Hiroshima of all places in Japan, uh, the G7 leaders, uh, according to some press reports, 
said, oh, you know, we have to urgently talk to the leaders of the global south because they have not joined the camp of democracy, they have not condemned Russia for the alleged unprovoked uh, war of aggression in Ukraine. Why is that? We have to urgently talk to them. Now, the reality is that it is the arrogance of power of the Western establishments that they have not noticed that, you know, the, all the policies of NATO and the West have completely boomeranged. They have caused a tremendous blowback because, you know, when the sanctions were declared against uh, Russia, which was supposed to bankrupt Russia in the short term, well, that did not happen. The Russian economy now is doing very well. They had a growth of 5.4% uh, in May, not exactly a bankruptcy. But more importantly, uh, the countries of the global south, they saw that and they saw how the United States uh, basically uh, stole the assets of Russia, more than $300 billion. And they said, wait a second, you know, maybe the if you put your assets in dollar, it's not so safe. Then the same happened with Afghanistan, $9 billion at a point when that country was about to starve. So the countries of the global south started to say it is no longer safe to trade in dollars. And they started to trade in their national currencies. And there is now a gigantic, quote, de-dollarization going on basically also because naturally countries in the south have observed the uh, banking crisis both in the united states and also in switzerland and so there is now a huge counter reaction by going for an own currency uh, a new international currency which is not based on monetary values but it's based it's going to be based on physical values this is an idea which was promoted by Lyndon LaRouche, my late husband, many years ago, uh, who wrote an extremely important article called Trade Without Currency, which develops this idea that you have to, uh, if you create a new stable currency, it has to be based on physical assets, on raw materials, gold being one of them, but also other raw materials. And that's exactly what is being now negotiated among the countries of the global south and Russia and China. And, you know, given the fact that the Western financial system is still, you know, as fragile as it was a couple of months ago when the banking crisis was going on in full, you know, the remedy would be not to say these countries of the global south are against the dollar, but to basically say that the United States should take the same protective measures uh, namely by reintroducing the Glass-Steagall banking separation and that way cushion the currency against the casino economy excesses uh, and that way, you know, prevent that the eventual crush, crash of the two quadrillion outstanding derivative debt uh, could come out, you know, in a big uh, blowout of the entire system. So there is a lot of uh, <clears throat> things which, you know, people are not being told in the right way. Uh, so that was a, a very important point of uh, discussion as well. But more in general, you know, the countries of the global south, because of the 10 years of collaboration with the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, have really developed a completely new self-conscious. They have received for the first time real economic development corridors, railways, uh, you know, I was just uh, thinking, you know, the Laos Kunming fast railway system has been uh, opened and uh, one of the participants, uh, Gerachi, Michele Gerachi, was recently traveling with that railway and he had a little video uh, and he showed it and he showed it how fast the train is going in China, where the tracks are built very well, and then how it is going in Laos also extremely well, and then how slowly the continuation of the train goes, for example, in Thailand and, and some other places. But people got a very clear idea of what a tremendous leap forward it is to have a fast train system. And Laos just happens to be the country in which the most 
cluster bombs were thrown uh, 50, more than 50 years ago uh, by the United States. And I think that shows you the difference, you know, either you throw cluster bombs or you build railways. And I think that that is the choice where the so-called developing countries are clearly choosing the road of development. Thanks. I know you have to leave, but I just have one more uh, question because, of course, you founded the Schiller Institute. In your speech, you spoke about Schiller's play, Don Carlos, and then it turned out another speaker, Liliana uh, Gorini, also mentioned Don Carlos. And I was wondering why you think Schiller is important and how could it be that the two of you came up with this same drama by Schiller? Well, Liliana, obviously, because Verdi is the national composer of Italy, and Verdi chose many libretti from Schiller and uh, set them to music in the form of operas. And, you know, the subject of Don Carlos, I thought, you know, was very fitting um, because, you know, Philip II was ruling over the uh, empire where the sun never sets. That was said at the time about the Spanish uh, Spanish Empire. And, you know, then the whole scene with uh, Marquis of Posa is the confrontation between the, you know, the king of a, of a suppressive um, kingdom, you know, which is uh, basically keeping peace by suppressing the people and keeping everybody down. And then Marquis of Posa sort of in the dialogue with him takes the matter of humanity as a whole. And um, it, 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 it's a very fitting situation because do you want to keep power just to keep power or do you do, do politics because you are concerned about the happiness of people? So I thought that this was a very fitting um, metaphor, so to speak, to describe what the real battle of the present time is all about. So I hope that this Verdi uh, Schiller and Schiller as such will inspire people to actually read this work because you know, if there was one author who was a master of statecraft, it was Friedrich Schiller, who actually said that the, the biggest uh, art, piece of art is the creation of political freedom. And I think that that is very, very true. Well, thanks very much. I think that's very important for people to remember is that is there anything else you would like to say to people here in the United States about what we could and should be doing? Well, I think, you know, the, the people of the United States uh, must make their voice heard. I think that is probably the most strategically important factor because we are so much on the verge of World War Three, and, you know, the the way how the Ukraine war evolves now is to talk about sending F-16 fighter jets. Uh, I mean, the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov has just come out and said that given the fact that these uh, fighter jets, F-16, can be uh, equipped with nuclear bombs, uh, that whenever from now on the Russians will see such a fighter jet over the territory of Ukraine, they have to assume that it could have a nuclear bomb and it puts the whole thing into a completely different category. Now that should get everybody have a shudder down their, their back or shiver or whatever. Um, because, you know, I mean, we are so close to the possible catastrophe of a nuclear war that, you know, it does require the people of the United States to clearly say that they do not want to go in this direction. Now, fortunately, it looks like there will be two candidates who have expressed their opposition to the confrontation uh, with Russia, unfortunately not entirely with China in the case of Trump, but you have Trump on the Republican side and you have uh, Robert Kennedy uh, Jr. on the Democratic side. And I think that if you then take the heroic campaign of Diane Sayre for Senate, I think you have voices who can actually completely change uh, the United States and turn the United States back into a force of goodness in the world. 
And to be part of that, you know, that should be the most noble desire of every patriotic American at this point. Well, thank you very much. I agree absolutely with what you're saying. Americans should join that. Americans also should go to the SchillerInstitute.com website, join the Schiller Institute and look for the activities there that are coming up as well as signing up for my campaign and to support the campaign. So thank you, Helga. I hope we can speak like this again sometime and uh, we'll be in touch. Okay, too soon. Yes. So just a short postlude to the interview with Helga Zepp LaRouche about the conference and her words. Uh, let me just share with you uh, here the Schiller Institute YouTube video page if you want to find the video recordings of the conference which are being rendered and posted it's right here, European nations must cooperate with the global south. Uh, this is panel one, panel two. I spoke uh, also on panel two, and uh, then there are a third and fourth panel, which I would really encourage everybody to take some time to review. Uh, I thought particularly of great importance as part of the whole was the fourth panel where there was a group of scientists who are what the media would call climate deniers, but who have done the work uh, to demonstrate what actually causes climate change. Um, also, perhaps extreme weather in terms of various galactic cycles, solar cycles, etc. There was a German industrialists who just gave some of the figures in terms of the fact that Germany produces only 4% or 11% of their energy consumption. And he said uh, somewhat ironically, therefore they weren't, he said, that's a really strong position to impose sanctions on Russia on whom you've depended for decades for reliable natural gas and uh, oil. So of course, Germany's industry is collapsing, their economy is collapsing. And I think when you combine that with what's happening with the farmers in Holland, the farmers in the United States, the farmers for that matter in Germany, what you see is that not only do we face the threat of thermonuclear war, but we face the threat of a complete implosion of everything we depend upon to actually physically exist. And of course, this is what I want to address in my campaign for U.S. Senate as a national campaign and an international campaign, is that there are certain universal matters which affect every human being, regardless of your language, your culture, your religion. Do you have food? Do you have clean drinking water? Do you have energy? Doesn't it seem that we could put aside some of these exacerbated differences and divisions to collaborate to ensure that these basic needs are met without violating the sovereignty of our respective nations. And that is the point that Helga Zepp-LaRouche has laid out in her 10 principles. So uh, on August 6th, which is the anniversary of the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and then uh, the 8th, uh, Nagasaki, uh, which killed hundreds of thousands of civilians unnecessarily, I will, the Schiller Institute will be participating as part of a broad coalition of many groups, including the Rage Against the War Machine, including the People's Party, including uh, many other peace groups, uh, rallies all over the country. There will be a rally near the United Nations from 1 to 4 p.m. on Sunday, August 6th, followed in the evening at 6 p.m. by a performance of the Mozart Requiem dedicated to the memory of those who unnecessarily perished on that day and really dedicated to ensure that we do not similarly condemn hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of people to death by insisting on this policy of pushing Russia 
China trying to stop a process of a new paradigm, which has the force of billions of people behind it. The United States has to return to the intention of our founding as a force for good in the world as opposition to the Zeusian legacy of an oligarchical system. So I hope very much that everybody in the New York area can go to the United Nations that day. There is a website which uh, will have details on sister rallies all over the country. And I will actually post that in the comments under this this evening so that you can find the Schiller Institute. Oh, Humanity for Peace. That's what it is, Humanity for Peace. I will be posting that uh, website under this in the chat to make sure you get it correct and that you can visit there and find out about all the activities or the activity near you. So hope to see you soon. Um, and please keep working to make your voice heard as Helga Zeplarouche said, and take some time over the coming days to watch that Schiller Institute conference. You'll be able to find all of the panels shortly on the Schiller Institute YouTube channel.